to be here, to be together, to learn about the issues, be informed when we vote, and even having the, the privilege to vote. We thank you so much for that freedom. We just pray your leadership and direction in this meeting today. We pray, Lord, for our nation. We pray that you would bring revival amongst your people and across this nation, that we would return to you and to the founding principles that uh, you bless uh, because they come from you. We do pray, Lord, for our troops in harm's way. We pray, Lord, your protection and watch care over them. We pray, Lord, that by your mercy that you would help us to elect men and women to, uh, to offices who are people of character, people of integrity, people of faith, Lord, that will begin to lead us in the right direction that we need to be going. So, Lord, I thank you for this, this club and the opportunity to come and uh, to be educated. So, Lord, we pray your blessings on it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Salute, pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to move on to our program now. And uh, uh, we've had Brandon Dutcher come here in the past for some time. I guess you've been with uh, OCPA from its uh, beginning, probably 17 years. OCPA is a conservative think tank. And uh, for the most part, uh, they provide a lot of the very good research, very solid research that our lawmakers can use. And I can tell you, by and large, they're a very strong free market and very conservative. Our lawmakers can use that research to craft good quality bills. Some of our lawmakers pay attention to it, and then the lobbyists get involved. And then it makes it a little bit more difficult. But um, uh, a couple of years ago, the Cole Henry Scholarship Bill, I believe was the name of it, was passed. And it was the first crack in the monopoly of funding of the government schools. And in that, uh, there was an opportunity for parents that weren't having their needs met in the government schools to receive a voucher. Sorry, I hate to use that word there, but a voucher uh, to, to enable them uh, to get some relief. And Brandon's organization has created a video, and he wanted to come and show that and talk about it a little bit today. So, if you will please welcome my friend. Unfortunately, Brandon's lost a lot of weight. He's kind of emaciated and skinny because he's allowing his wife to direct his diet. As you can see, my wife doesn't drink much. <laughs> emaciation about me. Please welcome Brandon Dutton. Education meant you, you go to the school near your house. 
Uh, it's not that way anymore. Most people still go to the local public school in their house, but a lot of people, you can go to magnet schools like the class and study school here, you can go to a charter school, you can go to virtual online high school, you can now uh, get a tax credit scholarship to go to a private school in Oklahoma, or you can get, as Charlie mentioned, a special needs voucher. Uh, and that's the subject of this movie. Uh, if you are in special education, if you have an IEP, and you're not pleased with what you're getting at the public school, you can get the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship to go to a private school if that private school participates in the program. The bill was passed in 2010 by the Republican legislature, led by, it was pushed through by Representative Jason Nelson and Senator Patrick Anderson. Uh, it was signed into law by Governor Brian Henry. Uh, the name on the bill, Governor Henry did not request this, it was suggested to him, and he agreed to it. Uh, his daughter, uh, who died as an infant uh, with a rare uh, disorder. Uh, the, there are now, I said public education is changing. There are now 27 some programs in roughly 22 states, voucher tax credit, education savings account, and so on. And school choice is, is marching forward. Uh, and it's very encouraging and very good. But whenever something like this passes, the empire strikes back. The empire always strikes back. Uh, I'm talking about the unions and the union establishment, free litigation, and that's what's the case here. They have, if you can believe this, I mean, if, if you're a PR guy, you just can't believe your client just did that. But the superintendents in Jinx and Union were talking about people making a quarter of a million dollars every year while leading their school districts onto the federal needs improvement list, uh, still getting paid a quarter of a million and are suing the parents of autistic children because the parents have the audacity to take advantage of a scholarship that's available to them under law. Um, it is every bit as outrageous as you think it is, based on what I just said, and even more so. It is outrageous. And Representative Nelson said, it's like the government suing grandma for signing up for Medicare. That's what's happening. It is sickening. And it's even more sickening when you see the, what you're about to see. And I get a to show up here. These children's lives are being changed, being rescued, being saved. Their, their entire trajectory of their life is changing for the better. And yet these educators are suing to try to block them. Let's watch it and then we'll take any Q&A. They didn't see that she was normal, but different. They just seen her with a disability. The foundation of it is to provide a choice to those parents who know best for their children of what would be the best educational environment for them. They are way behind at the start of the race. This is just helping them catch up a little bit. They saw our children and how well they're doing, that they'd understand why this is important. Well, the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship Program uh, was passed in 2010. It was a bipartisan effort. Democrat Governor Brad Henry at the time uh, signed the law. It's um, named for an infant daughter of, of the Henrys that died uh, of a rare neuromuscular disease. To have a Democrat, Governor Brad Henry, support the legislation and offer uh, his daughter's, his late daughter's name to it is a success in and of itself. 96,000 kids, about 15%, of all of our public school kids in Oklahoma are on an IEP or otherwise uh, referred to as uh, special education. There has been no better program in this state than that scholarship program to give parents of special needs hope. What this law does is allow them to take a portion of the money that the public school would have received uh, to educate that child with them to a private school that's accredited by the state uh, and that meets certain guidelines 
uh, as an effort to try to uh, give that child some relief and the, and the education that they need. I really believe that if we can reach those young people early, we can make dramatic gains. started noticing symptoms at 15 months. He had skills and words and then started losing them. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He has regressive autism. He was also diagnosed with apraxia, several different physical issues as well with his autism. We don't believe that Rob is intellectually delayed. Children can be recognized as being special needs or having a disability under the law, not just because of their academic performance or lack of academic performance. The kids with autism just require more support. They have the ability, they have the means, they just need the right support. Sometimes children that have that qualify for being special needs or having a disability are some of our smartest children that we have in our system, some of the smartest adults we have in our country things like art. I mean, a lot of these kids are really gifted at art and music. He could hum Mozart at 15 months. That most typical kids don't do that kind of stuff. I mean, these kids are really, I really think that they're brilliant. And it's just finding the right people to bring that out of them. But often they're just, you know, put into special ed rooms and kind of forgotten. they have challenges from a social perspective that oftentimes leads to bullying. And whether it's the school officials that are not necessarily taking the action that they need to take or being as proactive as they need to be, or if it's them not understanding some of these special needs and unique aspects of these children and recognizing that these aren't kids that are you know, being difficult or are uh, wanting the bullying or are the cause of the bullying, they just don't under, maybe don't fully understand the how the two connect together, the special need is what's causing the child to be bullied and the way the child reacts to it only makes it worse, even though they're not trying to make it worse. They just don't understand because they don't understand some of those social aspects. Especially with the nonverbal children, um, they can't come home and tell you I'm being you know, pushed around at school. And unfortunately, it's happening. It's happening a lot. You know, even if my son could talk, I don't think he would say anything. He is the type of child that if somebody were to push him, he would just smile. He would just smile and take it. Even if he had a broken bone, he'd probably just smile. So that is definitely a concern for me. Well, the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship is really designed to help families with children with special needs or with disabilities. The foundation of it is to provide a choice to those parents uh, who know best for their children of what would be the best educational environment for them. My worry was if he was in a special ed room, that he wouldn't be educated, um, and that was really important. I want him to go to college. I want him to do all the things his typical peers do. Even if he can't talk, he's gonna do those things. I don't blame the public schools because I know that the public schools here in Oklahoma are really financially strapped, um, but unfortunately, the money is not being given to the special ed. Most of the rooms are overcrowded, they're understaffed, the teachers are not paid well, they don't have the experience or the training to deal with our kids. Um, autism is so different from, from other disabilities. Good Shepherd is a new school. We are a school focusing on autism or any type of disorder on the autism spectrum. We want children to learn to, to talk and communicate as well as possible so that they can go on and have a very normal life and, and be able to be productive in society and, and have a happy life. Does he belt or make noises quite rude? Does he 
Does he pick at his cereal, throw down his cup, hoping to make someone else pick it up? They're very well trained and very, you know, very well supervised here. Rob is a wonderful child. I love him dearly. They are incredibly loving and compassionate. Just so devoted. He is very motivated by certain things, and so we use those little things that he loves to do, like his favorite toys or his favorite games or even his favorite snacks, and we will use those as reinforcement. I don't worry about him when I drop him off. When he was at public school, I worried about him the entire time. But here I know he's well taken care of. So when we sit down to work with a child, Rob or any child, when they give correct responses, we will reinforce their responses. So whether that means um, giving him 30 seconds with the slinky that he loves to play with or giving him one of the Skittles or fruit snacks that he loves. So it makes it to where he is learning to give those correct responses. And he gives them all hugs and kisses goodbye, so I know he's happy here. Well, I think one of the major reasons why the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship was able to be passed, it's intended to help those children have a special need. It really is a group of children who warrant the special protection, and in the eyes of the law, are already provided uh, special protection. And so to have this opportunity available to them through a scholarship is really just a furtherance of protecting those children to ensure that they have the educational environment available to them that is best for them. That scholarship is a major supporter for the families. You know, with the cost being 21000 a year, that's a big chunk of money for, for a family to lay down. And those that can, I'm sure, you know, would do that. But at the same time, there are many families who are struggling and, and have more than one child who needs special services. So without that scholarship, I'm sure five of the eight families that we have here now probably wouldn't be able to be here. It cut the tuition in half. That money really, I mean, that money is allocated to him in the public schools, but I don't think it actually really goes to him in the public school. This way he's at, the money's actually going to him. It's being spent on him. The knowledge that without this applied behavior analysis intervention, these kids would not have another opportunity to excel like they would here. So some of them are going on to college. One of the girls enrolled in the biology program uh, and did a research project with one of the professors there. Um, we've got others who are studying math that are a absolute whizzes, uh, some that are in uh, some of the computer sciences. A lot of them may be able to go on and be very successful, but we've got to start with programs when they're really young to make sure that happens. This bill is only helping kids. It's not hurting anybody. I, I really strongly believe if they saw our children and how well they're doing, that they'd understand why this is important. It was like a week she turned three. It was just like a little switch in her had been flipped. She wasn't really speaking or she didn't have a lot of facial expressions. She started to throw just horrible fits where she would tear out her hair and rake her face and just, you know, fits that you wouldn't normally see from, that you wouldn't think you'd normally see from a child. Individuals with autism, typically what we're going to see are people who have significant language impairments as well as socialization kinds of impairments. We may also see some behavioral issues with that because if you can't talk and tell somebody what you want to do or what you're thinking or what you need, you're going to probably be frustrated. I know I would. She runs the household. Yeah, everything revolves around 
her therapies, her appointments. It, it sometimes can feel isolating because other people don't understand. She has a very regimented existence, just lots of schedules and lists of things you do before you get ready for bed, for instance. But that helps her, so that's, that's fine, but that's a lot different than life before she came along. <laughs> I was having a moment and I felt like I needed to, I needed help. I emailed the Oklahoma Autism Network and they called me the next day. And then she emailed me all sorts of information. She told me about it on the phone and she also included a link for the scholarship there in the email. Every teacher is teaching specific skill sets to the child to help them fill in their specific needs. Every child there, you can go there and see it for yourself, is special in their own way and they all have their own challenges. They, they don't just teach academics ABCs and that sort of thing. They teach them like life functioning skills to brush like your teeth, to, to help training. potty training. They're all very loving and kind hearted. I don't know what we would do without the school. Many of the students are so bright, they just amaze me. Uh, they may not be able to tell you anything, but you ask them to do something and they can do so many things. She had very limited speech. And she started going there October 1st, I believe. And just in that, that little amount of time, <laughs> you can tell she's a chatterbox now and she was not, she, not before. She's come a long way, she's done a 180. The more functional that these kids can be brought up to be, the less of a burden they would be on the state and their resources going forward. Our daughter may require supervision and somebody there to be an advocate for her until she's 80. And so I'm probably not gonna be that person just based on my age. It'll be a state function. And so the more functional she can be, the more of a burden that will be taken off of the state in the future. She's very kind hearted and she she wears her emotions right out of her sleeve and, you know, I think anyone that would meet my daughter or any of these kids that go to Good Shepherd would say that they deserve every chance they can get. They are way behind at the start of the race. This is just helping them catch up a little bit. It was a struggle from kindergarten all the way to seventh grade. I felt like some kids actually waited till I got to school and then bullied me all the way till I got till it was time for me to go home. Sometimes kids, when I'm passing, sometimes they would tease me about things and, and say how a retard I was sometimes. And it upset me really bad. Many times, children with special needs are those that, are, that suffer at the hands of bullying. And uh, we've heard a lot lately uh, you know, in the media about bullying and the effects it has on the child. Sometimes, sometimes I wouldn't even go to lunch because of the teasing and I was, I was scared to go sit next to everybody. Felicia would hide out in the bathroom. She um, talked about killing herself. So I would go in the bathroom, I would eat my lunch in there, or I would cry about it in the bathroom. And it wasn't just the kids, it was the teachers too, but because they just you know, felt like that Felicia was always the problem. It was like she got in trouble 
for something that somebody else did to her. Since the kids felt like Felicia was the problem, the teachers felt like she was the problem. They didn't see that she was normal, but different. They just seen her with a disability. Well, Felicia has Asperger's, OCD. She also has ADHD. Asperger's is essentially a social disorder where a child doesn't necessarily know how to properly socially interact with other children. Because of that disorder, that sometimes leads to bullying, that sometimes leads to frustration from the teachers with that child. It was hard going to, through a school every day that really didn't seem to care about it. I seen it in the paper, and it was like a, a blessing was going to help uh, my daughter go to school, where she didn't have to go to school and be afraid of, you know, who's going to tease her or hiding in the bathroom or getting fussed at by the teachers. And I seen it, and I, I immediately just got so excited. We're also going to have a play on words because it's going to be the name of one of our characters whose name is Ernest. So the importance of being Ernest. And we, yeah, being the character Ernest. So we're going to go ahead and start Act One. And this is going to be a situational comedy and a comedy of errors is what it's called. So a comedy of errors are always disguises and there are always characters. Town & Country started in 1961. It was founded by a group of parents whose children had learning disabilities. We're Oklahoma's only non-public, non-profit, full day program for children who have attention disorders, learning disabilities, autism and Asperger's. I love my teachers. They they talk to me and they really seem really, whenever things are going bad for me, it seems like they really are wor really worried about me. They have just a special way with our kids. They just take a very individualized approach. They work with our kids one-on-one. -on -one. Every child here has their special needs and we address them one by one. Confidence, self-assurance, being able to feel like she's somebody. Walking with her head up, tall. She's got friends. She feels comfortable with the teachers. Felicia wakes up wanting to go to school. I felt like that I can talk to the kids. Because, I mean, I have made a lot of friends at Town & Country that I couldn't make at the other school. And I feel accepted. One of her English teachers are encouraging her to write stories. She wants to be a book writer. My favorite thing to write about is actually about teenagers, what I am. And this book is about, what I'm writing about is about this group, these two girls, and I write about all the great antics that her adventures that they get into while their parents, is go their parents are gone. Once they feel that they can learn, they will learn. Our children are very bright. They just learn differently. Just thinking back on it now, I mean, where Felicia is now, it's such a relief. I can actually come home, rest, go to work. When Felicia was in public schools, she would literally um, crawl in a ball because she did not want to go to school. To go back in that time now, it's, it, it's, it frightens me every time I think about it, you know. I probably feel hopeless because school was a daily challenge for me every day. And now it's not anymore, and I'm glad. All we're needing is somebody to understand that we're just wanting our child to have the education that any child out here deserves or needs. 
I just want my child to be able to go to school. That's all. If, if it's anything that I can do, we can do together to help kids that have a disability, this is it. This is the answer. This is what works for them. This is it. At its core, the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship is bringing opportunity to the neediest of Oklahomans. There's 149 kids involved in the program now in schools around the state. It is taking the public resources and servicing those that need our help that we are supposed to look after and make sure that they have the same opportunity that the rest of us have. They know their child and they know their child can learn and they know their child has dreams regardless of their disability to be a contributing member of our, of our society, of our country. Every child out there can learn. They need an effective educator to pull out of them uh, the things they need pulled out of them. We make sure that we're providing that opportunity to these children and to their families. It's really a, a wonderful program that's exceeded my expectations, quite frankly, and has had an impact on the lives of children that, uh, that quite frankly, I, I would have thought somebody was exaggerating and they told me uh, what would happen. I'm a believer and I think a lot of other people are too at this point. wrap this up in about five minutes here, but I want to I want to couch it so you'll understand this program, and if I'm wrong in it, you correct me on this. <clears throat> There's a funding formula for special needs children. That amount of money was going to the schools to take care of these kids. Some schools have programs that are pretty effective for them. For many of you may not know uh, Paula and Molly Wernberg that are with us in a lot of events and a lot of things. Their son, and I can't think of his name right now, but he is an autistic child that's now functioning at a very high level because he got some good help and some training. However, some school districts were just warehousing these kids, really not doing anything with them. So they were getting the money, which is higher than a normal ADA, a little higher than that. And all this program did is said, hey, parent, if you're satisfied with what your school's providing for your child, leave them in the school. But if you're not, we're going to give you this, this, this scholarship and you can put them wherever you want. And that's basically the essence of what this plan did. It didn't cost any additional money or anything like that. It was just simply a plan to give more expertise help to. So, Brandon, I'm going to let you, if you can wrap it up in five minutes, Jim. I don't even have a wrap up. I'll just take any questions or comments and then let that, Tina. That money does come out of that school. That yes, it, it does. Okay. That's right. It's not in the school. That's why, it, that's why they're suing. Actually, only 90% comes out. They leave behind 10% for, so they still get 10% even though there's no child educated. Do you know how much money that is per student? It varies, whether it's a mild learning disability all the way up to something profoundly disabled. It could be anywhere from just your typical seven, eight, nine thousand up to, as they mentioned, 21,000. Well, I think you said half of them. Yeah, half of them. Half of them. Uh, my name is Paul Moss. I don't know if you know me or not. I want to add a comment and ask a question. So, my family would be eligible for this grant. I know a number of families that are using this grant, and I know a number of more families that want to use this grant. Uh, give you a concept. I have fought the battle that these families have already fought in the <coughs> and won. And uh, 
what's taking place is where a child wants to learn, needs a special, needs additional funding, gets additional services, learn how to read, learn how to write. It may cost the school $200, $2,000, or whatever. And they're saying they're not want to spend that. And what takes place is they will hire attorneys, RFR firm, and spend millions of dollars, literally, of our tax buyers' money, fighting us to keep us from opening up this gates to get these simple services to these children because they're worried about the floodgates that will take place. Now, the, the point is, you yes, ask, why is it important that we fight for just this little bit of money for these children right now? And what the concept is, is we're trying to teach, we're trying to make these families and these children self-sufficient when they become adults. Now, we can invest the money now as they're a young child, or we can spend the money as, as thousands of dollars per day as an adult. Many states, well, what they do to, to see how many, to determine how many jail beds they'll know in the future is to see how many third graders do not know how to read. Because there's, there's a direct link from illiteracy to people that will be in jail. And while all Jason Nelson and the groups are doing is we're trying to stop it, we're trying to make these children self-sufficient as they become an adult. Yes, how young does it start? Uh, if you're young enough to be eligible for an IEP um, special ed, so I think that's age three. Three. Is, uh, is the grant still available from since the lawsuit? That's what a number of families are still. Yeah, no, excellent school. question. This matter is now before the Oklahoma Supreme Court. As I said, the Jenks and Union sued the parents. Tulsa judge ruled the wrong way. Now it's before the Oklahoma Supreme Court, who's been very close to the vest, and they haven't even announced whether or not they're going to accept it. Robert Henry's amicus brief, which fortunately Robert, Robert Henry was a very respected legal mind, former 10th Circuit judge, I wrote an amicus brief uh, for this saying, hey, if you strike this down, watch out for my, my Pell Grants and, you know, what, you know, watch out for, can I use Medicaid at, at Mercy Hospital? I mean, you open a can of worms if you strike this down. So we're hopeful that the court will, will rule in our favor. Um, until then, the judge stayed the order, so all the kids are still in it. Nothing has changed with them. But the court will rule, and if it goes against us, then retool and, and come up with something else, a tax credit, scholarship, an education savings account. Um, school choice will go on. This this program is not the end all and be all. It's just it's just the beginning. Bob, can these funds follow a student to a religious school? Yes, and that's. That's the crux of the other side's argument right now. Oklahoma has what's called a Blaine Amendment, as 37 or so states do, trying to prohibit money going to sectarian institutions. Our argument is the money goes to the parents, they can choose it. Town and country, for example, is not a, it's not a sectarian school. Uh, Good Shepherd, obviously, is. So the parents can choose whichever. So we're claiming it doesn't violate the Blaine Amendment. But that's the, the crux of the argument before the court right now. Yes. Do they apply just one time, or do they have to apply every year? Or? No, once they get it, uh, I think they're in. Yeah, that's. So it, it, it will follow them throughout mm -hmm. their educational. Right, right. Well, I just wondered if uh, uh, if you've looked into the system used by South Dakota, because in Oklahoma, the system here totally failed with my daughter. And I had to send her to South Dakota, where she's doing quite well up there now. Uh, she can read a little bit now. She's 29 years old. So it was a total washout in Oklahoma at the time she was going to school here. They just hauled her to and from uh, and uh, warehouse. Where all that? I hear that so often. Yes. Um, I know a little bit of how the process works, but can you maybe explain to others that don't know how to request an IED, which starts the process? Yeah, now, uh, I wish Jason Nelson were here. I don't know, but not having a special needs kids, I wouldn't know how to, you know, I assume you'd go to your principal and say, I, I can't do that. Yeah. Basically, uh, as a parent, you're going to notice that there's something different with your child, starting at about age three, if, if it's an autism spectrum, or once you get into school in the first few years, you notice that the child's lagging behind, falling behind the grades, it has a hard time taking attention. At that time, you you know, this, you may seek guidance from the school and they may make recommendations. 
or you may seek a doctor and have them evaluated and stuff, and they'll get input from these schools. And they do line item tests to you know, evaluate if like, a child has ADD. Um, more, if you're not savvy on what to ask for or not knowledgeable on what to ask for, your child can get overpassed. Uh, my child had uh, uh, dyslexia and uh, severe dyslexia, and uh, the state refused to accept a diagnosis of dyslexia for a number of years until he was in eighth grade. And we identified it in first grade asking for services, uh, where he was placed into a, uh, a school environment which involved restraint and seclusion. And uh, that's where we fought when we took him to federal court and we settled. But um, the key thing is just, you just got to be a parent. If you know there's something wrong, or your grandparent, you know there's something wrong, stand up for your child, fight for your child. The best advocate for your child is yourself. And don't give up and keep on fighting. There's resources such as uh, Pete Rights and Rights Law. That's where I began my battle. And uh, they have an annual class uh, annually up at UCO for teaching parents and grandparents uh, your rights as parents to advocate for your child. And we're going to let uh, Tina close this here. And uh, we need to close it. If there's any questions on any state questions, we'll take that if we finish here. Hi, as Brandon said, my name is Tina Corby Zarishin, and I am the Policy Impact Director at OCPA, and I just wanted to call your attention. I put these cards on your table. If you would like more information about what we've talked about today or about really any of our various initiatives, we have for fiscal freedom, a center for constitutional freedom, obviously we have the center for education freedom, um, and also for energy freedom. We do research in all of these areas from the perspective of limited government. We want to support free enterprise, and basically we just think that the individual is the most creative and innovative force today, not government, and so we want to do everything we can, but we are a 501c3, which means our primary purpose is to educate. So we couldn't do what you did today and say, vote yes, vote no, elect so-and-so, don't elect so-and-so, but as, as you mentioned, our research is very helpful in informing legislators, so what the Policy Impact Team does is basically just make sure that our information gets out there and you guys can put whatever spin on it you want. You can call the legislator and say, hey, I read this OCPA study and based on that study I think you should do X. So please just put your name and contact information if you'd be interested at all in receiving our research um, or, or disseminating it in various ways and I'll get in touch with you. You can just leave them on the table and I'll them. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. And, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, we are different. We're a political action committee, and we can be just as hardcore political as we want to be. That's, that's the difference here. Um, one of the things I do want to mention, we had a program on autism with Wayne Brody here. Wayne was the major advocate for a law that would have required insurance companies to provide coverage for autistic children. The Republicans refused to allow that to be heard, and I certainly oppose that. And I think it was based upon this. It was based upon the fact that, and, and, and you know, the Republicans and Democrats were arguing over how much it would increase the insurance rates for everybody if you did that. And we had a program here with Wayne, and believe me, I had many conversations with Wayne and his wife also on the issue. <clears throat> um, one of the things that happened is Richard Engel offered if Wayne would be willing to start a foundation a very large contribution to that foundation to start that, to help children with autism. Wayne did not do that. Uh, we were successful, in my opinion, in not doing that because about 40% of your health care cost right now and your insurance is because of mandates. There's a better way to do it. And that is to create a very minimal base, what's called a Volkswagen, an old-fashioned Volkswagen insurance policy. And then, and then allow for um, add-ons, a kind of a cafeteria stock. That way a young couple going to have children, they might well be interested in paying a higher insurance premium, but to cover themselves. Someone old like myself, or someone without children, never plans on having children, can't have, whatever, they may never be interested in that particular add-on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, somebody uh, young might not be interested in prostate coverage or something to that nature. And, and so by having a base and allow people those choices of how they want to go that, I think is a better way than mandating. And while it, 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 in the mandate it spreads the cost over, 
you know, understand that those individual things might cost a little bit more. But ultimately, Wayne moved out of state. I believe they moved to Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken. Because Minnesota has a law that requires insurance companies uh, to provide autism coverage for their children. And the bill they were pushing was actually a bill that would have uh, also required it upon those who already had it. Uh, and I can't remember, what, what do you call that? I can't remember what you uh, call it. Pre-existing condition. And I ran the figures on it. The maximum amount it would have cost insurance companies in Oklahoma was about $80 million based upon the number of kids here that are estimated to be here that have autism. And to think that an $80 million tack on to the insurance company's uh, exposure to them is not going to affect your rates very much, I think it's foolish to think that. But you know what's interesting? Under the idea of federalism and states' rights, if a state like Minnesota wants to require that coverage, then maybe that's where you ought to move. And if a state like Oklahoma doesn't, by the way, Wayne took a parting shot at me in the, in the press. Uh, and I like the guy, don't misunderstand. He took a parting shot at me in the press on his way out of town. And that's fine, I've never answered that before now. But a state that doesn't want to do that, then that's up to that state whether they want to do that. And that's a part of what federalism and states' rights are all about. And, and so, uh, I like to say, I think there's a better way. Uh, it's an emotional situation. The day Wayne was here, Mike McNutt from Oklahoma showed up. We had a guy, <laughs> I won't mention his name, he's, he's running around from over here, so and Wayne calls him. And he said, just rub a little something cream on his forehead and forget about it. And of course, that makes the paper the next day. And uh, I actually talked with Wayne, and the cream that he mentioned, is something that a lot of parents that have autistic children, they actually use it. It's a chelation cream designed to move heavy metals out of the body. And so it didn't really offend Wayne. It's just the way he said it. It certainly didn't look good. And, and, and so now I have to deal with it the next day in the press. And so anyway, thanks. I appreciate all of you. Real, real quick. And you, you ran to the state house, didn't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and Bobby Cleveland. That's right. kind of the launch of my career, political career, was uh, advocating for children and special needs. Uh, one quick note, the, the services that Wayne was asking for is technically a lot of those services are already supposed to be provided at the public school. And the public schools are refusing to provide these services. And that's one of the purposes of why this grant yeah. started. Yeah. Is so we can get the children. I, I've known some other uh, families that have had autistic children. And that range is from very severe to mild. And the schools, some of the public schools years ago provided some service for them. And those kids have come through and they're functioning at a fairly high level now. Evidently, when the child is first diagnosed with autism, uh, the quicker you can get help for them, uh, the better their chance of, of, of developing a functioning ability. We'll go down the list starting with 758. And uh, this is the one that lowers caps from 5% to 3% on your property tax. What this will not affect is if you get a judgment in your county. This will also not affect if there's a school bond that's passed. But that's the way the law is right now. What this does do is limit the amount that they can raise that. And when this all came about, when we put a cap on this to start with at 5%, there were no caps. And what used to happen, Steve, do you have the ballot? I do not. Come up here, please. What used to happen is there were years, particularly particularly in the years of before Penn Square Bank, property values were going up sometimes 15, 20, 25, 35% a year. And all of a sudden, you got whacked with a huge property tax increase. So we put a state question out there, and the citizens said you cannot raise them more than 5% in a year, aside from those other things that I mentioned. Well, what happened, particularly people with new homes, um, it became an automatic five. 
and add automatic five, your property tax doubles every 14 years under the rule of 72. So all this is going to do is lower that cap to 3%. If it's automatic every year, then it's going to take 21 or 22 years to double your property tax. And so that's basically that. Let's go on to the next one. We had our meeting here last week with uh, on the affirmative action thing with Ward Connolly. I wanted to vote on last year's week. I didn't get the ballots out in time. I'm not going to take time to talk about that. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, on removing the governor from all paroles, uh, she'd still be involved in the violent criminal paroles. I think this is really a bad idea. And the reason being is if you remove the governor, you put, the, you put this totally in the hands of unelected bureaucrats who are not responsive to the citizens at all. And, it, and it's just one more layer. I know it's a little more work. She's got the staff to inform her. And uh, I, I would highly recommend voting against state questions 762. Number 764, I, I think it's a little bit more difficult. I'm going to recommend a no vote here. And what 764 would do, if it passes, it would allow for the Oklahoma Water Resources Board to issue up to $300, $300 million. Are we ready to go? Okay. I hang on to it. Just a second. I'm going to finish with this one. It would allow them to issue up to $300 million in bonds. Most of that bond indebtedness will then be borrowed by local cities. Local cities or perhaps counties. Why? Well, <clears throat> They can already borrow money anyway. They can already go into bond debtors. <clears throat> but our Constitution puts limits on the amount that local communities can be indebted up to. And they've done that wisely. And some of these communities have reached their max. And they want to borrow more money. And that's unwise. Well, this is a way they could borrow it without them being necessarily responsible for the bond indebtedness. They're responsible to pay it back. But if they default on it, then the people in the state have to pick, pick that up. So it's a, it's a transfer of responsibility from a local community that should be responsible for their own infrastructure needs to, a, uh, to the state of Oklahoma. So I'm recommending a no on that one. On 765, uh, this is one that's it's, it's not all that big of an issue, but I believe that if we'll pass 765, we again get rid of a board that is appointed by elected officials, but they can't remove the people off of these boards until their terms are up. And it puts it back into more of a responsive situation by elected officials. So I'm recommending a yes on 765. State question 765. Yes. So if I, if I understand what you said a little ago, to support and vote yes on this would mean that we would rather have the governor appoint? The governor already appoints uh, some of the people, maybe all the people that are on the commission, but the governor can't remove them. And this puts it more back into the hands of the legislature and the governor who are more accountable to the people. We don't know exactly for sure what the new, uh, the new makeup will be but I believe it's going to be more responsive than the commission that exists today. Thanks. Okay. All right. Vote. Get your ballots up here. If you could come help us with the count. Oh, yeah, you need one, don't you? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a lot on the table today. Uh, thank you for bearing up through our technical problems. Next week, we're going to have Bill Shepard here with Center Poll. He's going to talk about the national polls and polling in the state of Oklahoma.